dearest gentle viewer, I wanted to turn your attention to the television production Bridgerton, as it is a most accomplished depiction of polite society in our beloved England. While it is an extravagant thrill by any measure, one must ask themselves if it does not cross the line into the fantastical. It is time for the members of the Ton to hear which traditions can indeed be found in our histories and which are mere delusions stemming out of the imaginations of 21st century playwrights. Let's start right at the top with the royal family. Bridgerton is a piece of fiction that is set in Regency-era England. In 1813, when the show begins, the king is George III. At this point, he had been reigning since 1760 and was 75 years old. He also had no idea what was real or not. The king suffered from a combination of mental and physical illnesses, and his condition only deteriorated as the years passed. In 1810, the death of his beloved daughter Amelia sent him spiraling and he never returned to lucidity. His son and heir, who was also called George, was named Regent in 1811 as a result. He thus assumed the responsibilities of being king until his father died in 1820 and he himself became George IV and then ruled as king in his own name until his death in 1830. The term Regency England applies most narrowly to the period between 1811 and 1820, which is also when most of the events of Bridgerton take place. The Regent only appears as a brief non-entity in the Queen Charlotte spin-off, which limits our understanding of this time and these people. After all, Bridgerton exists in the shadow of a lifelong conflict between the prince and the regent. Let's just compare the two to see what I mean. On the one hand, we have a king who we can say has a certain sense of duty. He is interested in developing the country and personally tries to innovate agriculture and astronomy. While he does live in a palace, he seems to be personally frugal and prefers not to spend too much money on things like balls and dances. And on the other, then, a regent who has racked up debts of 90 million pounds in today's money by decorating his house, buying clothes, throwing parties, and gambling before he is even 35. And when he is finally named regent in 1811, guess what he does? He froze another huge party. 2,000 guests were invited to this extravagant event that cost 20 million pounds in today's money and included such indulgences as a table ornament that was actually a stream filled with live fish, as well as professionally drawn chalk art on the ballroom floor, meant to be admired briefly before being obliterated by the dancers. But this conflict was certainly not as morally one-sided as you may think. The king also had the regent whipped when he was a child as a form of discipline, whereas the regent was a major patron of English culture. Bridgerton would not exist without Jane Austen, and guess who had a set of her books at each one of his houses? The regent. The unfortunate thing about watching a show is that the characters are not people, they are caricatures. Most people on Bridgerton are either completely irredeemable or morally upstanding to a fault. If they do display any negative traits, like Anthony having a not exactly serious relationship with an actress, it is a mere obstacle on their way to their happily ever after. But real life is not only more complex, it is also more diverse. The cast might make you think that Bridgerton is a pretty diverse show, but what it fails to capture are the divisions that existed in the highest levels of society. 
This is particularly apparent when comparing the depiction of Queen Charlotte to her real self. In the show, she is this big girl boss who is seen as a style icon. But she only takes this role because they did not care to include the regent that much. In reality, she wore clothes that the protagonists of Bridgerton would find outdated, not praiseworthy. She would certainly have some support and respect, especially amongst the older crowd, but she really stood for a more traditional way of doing things. The regent attracted the attention of a completely different crowd of people, those who wanted to live life lavishly but couldn't under the more restrained court life of his father. Others yet might reject the queen for being out of touch and the regent for being immoral. Unfortunately, in Bridgerton, all these different people get boiled down into one ton, all playing by the same rules, when in reality they weren't even playing the same game. The upper echelons of British society consisted of two, in their eyes distinct, groups of people, namely the peerage and the landed gentry. These people ran society in any way that mattered. To be seen as a member of either group, you had to be a significant landowner. You were supposed to make your living, not by working, never by working but by collecting rent from ordinary people who lived on the land that you owned. This qualified you to be a member of the landed gentry, but to climb to the top of the social pyramid, you really had to be a peer. Peers were all the dukes and duchesses, marquesses and marchionesses, earls and countesses, viscounts and viscountesses, barons and baronesses of the realm. In the show, the Bridgertons are shown to be significantly more respected than the Featheringtons. This is not just due to their wealth or even their behavior. This is due to the fact that they are Viscounts and the Featheringtons have no rank. And this hierarchy had to be obeyed. At formal events, a lower ranking person could not even speak to a higher ranking one unless they were formally introduced to this higher ranking person first. The show is about all these aristocrats who really held a position of enormous power and privilege. Owning land meant that they were in control of the economy, which was still predominantly based on agriculture. Peers sat in the House of Lords as a matter of right, and the landed Gentry basically chose representatives from amongst themselves to sit in the House of Commons. Until 1832, you basically had to be a member of the landed gentry to vote. Control of both houses of the legislature meant that these people determined the fate of the nation. The aristocrats also dominated culture, or fashion, art and architecture were all funded through their personal spending and reflective of their aesthetic preferences. I hope you have started to see why the marriages of their children were so important. Marriages were political alliances, economic transactions and social events all at once. Marriages of the children were expressions of power dynamics between their parents. Each season of Bridgerton corresponds to an actual season. The season was a time each year between November and June when Parliament was in session and so the aristocracy had to be in London to attend. So the whole marriage game that frames each season of Bridgerton really only exists as a result of this fact. In Regency England, women were basically trained for marriage from a young age. Their education focused on making them pleasing for men in one way or another. Beyond gaining basic skills like reading or writing, you are thus quite limited in your prospects. You may learn how to play instruments like the harp or piano, as you see multiple of the Bridgerton girls do in the show. Perhaps you'd learn to embroider, learn to speak a few foreign languages, chiefly French, 
but really you were just expected to know how to be agreeable when it came to men. You're supposed to be smart enough to not be boring to talk to, but not so smart that you might make a man feel like he knows less than you. You're meant to be light, pleasant, subservient, someone who would be a source of grace and beauty for the man. Your life as a woman began with your coming out to society. You might be presented to Queen Charlotte, as you see in the show, but this was not a necessity. After that, you would be followed around by a chaperone from event to event. There was no shortage of events to attend. Families would go to the theater multiple times per week. There are also tons of balls and parties. They were hosted at people's houses or at formal gathering places. The best spot for socializing in general was at Almax, of course. Only the most distinguished aristocrats were allowed into this establishment, which was really a ballroom for holding dances. Many a Bridgerton scene would likely have played out at Almax in real life. Membership was controlled by seven patronesses, who represent the regency perhaps as well as the regent himself. The patronesses were wives of rich titled men. They analyzed every application carefully and continually reassessed the suitability of each member. Clearly it was not enough to be rich and high on the hierarchy. You had to enjoy the express favor of specific people within the town to even get your foot through the door at many of these events. This cult of exclusivity led to aristocrats prioritizing getting their daughters in at all max rather than presenting them to the queen. While people were kicked out and denied entry for the smallest of offenses, like when the patronesses turned away the Duke of Wellington, the man who had basically defeated Napoleon on the field of battle for trying to come in seven minutes too late, patronesses themselves engaged in numerous affairs. Three of them had been with the same guy, though probably not at the same time. The first of them, the Countess of Jersey, was so prolific that when her husband was asked why he did not fight a duel to defend his wife's honor, he said that to do that he would have to fight every man in London. The second, Countess de Leven, was herself outraged at how once, when she was at a ball, so many couples wandered off into the bushes that by the end of the dance, almost the only people left in the ballroom were debutantes, chaperones, and the host. Which might be a bit hypocritical, as at least a few of the couples in the bushes were probably married. It is clear that the morality of the Regency era was never as strict as you might have thought. It was possible to bend the rules if you had enough influence. By the way, the third one of the bunch, Countess Cowper, married the guy she cheated with once her first husband died. Women were at the mercy of their male counterparts. The men held all of the cards as they were the ones who would inherit titles and be in control of the cash. The system and the rules leaned heavily in favor of the men. Like in Bridgerton, it was pretty normal for the men to rake around. Some men took the path of Anthony and had a regular pre-marriage companion. Some took the path of Colin, traveling around Europe on the Grand Tour, probably stealing marbles from Greece. Others yet definitely took the path of Benedict, getting intimate with London's bustling cultural scene, which, thanks to the region's spending, was coming to rival even that of Paris. The only thing that was difficult for some of the men was figuring out a suitable job, such as bishop, officer, physician, or barrister that would allow them to keep living their lifestyle, since most of the money and all of the titles and property went solely to the oldest son. Within this context of a strict but often fluid set of rules and expectations, some independence was still possible. Men and women could dance together at Almax. They could promenade in St. James Park and arrive at their own opinions, but only to a certain extent. 
consent of the parents had to be obtained after all. So you could make a choice and your choice would probably be respected, but only if you chose a valid candidate in the first place. Many marriages were certainly a love match as they are called in Bridgerton. That should not be surprising given the generally comfortable life and similar backgrounds of the people involved. But since divorce remained essentially impossible until 1857, many marriages were awful, full of cheating and abuse. Bridgerton certainly gets a few details right. Even an integral part of the plot, the Lady Whistledown gossip pamphlet, is not completely unprecedented. There was a tete a tete column in the town and country magazine around this time that recounted gossip surrounding a different couple every month. While the rise of so-called Silver Fork novels of the 1820s and later brought the social habits of the aristocracy to the homes of the wider reading public. Some people might think that the most outlandish aspect of Bridgerton is the diverse cast. But this is only unrealistic because of the exclusionary and outright racist beliefs of the English aristocracy at this time. The biggest problem with Bridgerton is something else entirely. The Regency was born out of a tumultuous, uncertain time for everyone involved. The French Revolution made many nobles realize that their position in society might be very tenuous. The mood swung from being scared and shocked in the 1790s when the royal family were executed, to outright terrified in the early 1800s when an invasion of the British mainland seemed imminent, to just completely triumphant another 10 years later once Napoleon was defeated. One might have thought that the age of kings and emperors would continue, that the rich and powerful would be able to party forever, suppressing anyone who stood up to them. And yet, we see successive expansions of the franchise, until every citizen, whether they were a man or a woman, could vote. The regent certainly can be thanked for this. While his father regularly got involved in the political business of the day, even threatening to veto a bill in 1807, George, both as regent and as king, did not care at all about anything that was happening in parliament as long as he got money for parties. Without royal involvement, the political power of the king faded within a generation, so by the time Victoria came to the throne in 1837, any political meddling was basically unthinkable. Although the aristocracy was always split, the regent gradually lost favor with them altogether. Some certainly supported him, since he made them feel like it was okay to live life lavishly at a time when the majority of the population in Britain faced declining living standards, and that's before even getting to the situation in the colonies but ever more thought that he was not rising to the occasion and were disgusted by his open displays of immorality and opulence. Perhaps that is why the views of the aristocracy became more restrained by the time of Queen Victoria, as this made the excesses of Regency London impossible. This was also a time of major scientific breakthroughs that seemed to be happening on a weekly basis and the creeping industrialization. A doubling of the English population from 6 million in 1760 when George III came to the throne to 12 million in 1820 when he died led to a doubling of incomes for the aristocracy. However, the industrialization definitely hurt them in the long term. Their aversion to work did not help them in a time when less and less of the economy depended on agriculture and thus their massive land holdings, and ever more on industry, controlled by newly rich men. Their wealth would start eclipsing that of even the most distinguished aristocrats within a few decades after the events of Bridgerton. Within a lifetime, the aristocracy fell from grace. 
Without the same levels of wealth and political power, culture too slipped into the hands of publicly and privately funded theaters, museums, galleries, and orchestras. Rising levels of wealth and a growing middle class also redirected the attention of authors, tailors, and even furniture manufacturers. Bridgerton does not need to be, and perhaps should not be, a political show. Making the characters deluded bimbos and himbos works perfectly. But this was a time period marked by intense tension and change. It would have been good to see that, and it would have added to the drama if the audience knew that the characters were living through an illusion that was going to shatter sooner rather than later. Thank you so much for watching this video. Press the like button if you liked the video and subscribe for more. See you next time.